name is Tyler, and welcome to Context for Kids, where I teach you guys stuff most adults don't even know. If this is your first time hearing, or if you've missed anything, you can find all the episodes archived at contextforkids.podbean.com, which has them downloadable, or at contextforkids.com, where I have transcripts for readers, or on my Context for Kids YouTube channel. Now today I'm going to teach you guys about something that maybe you haven't heard of before, and that's the importance of boundaries. You may think of a boundary as the fence around your yard, or maybe the edges of a playground at school or the local park. A boundary tells us where one area ends and another area begins. Boundaries can be for protection, which can be a good thing, Or they can be put up as a way to keep people separated, which can sometimes be a really bad thing. Whether a boundary is good or bad depends on the context. If you've ever visited someone in the hospital who was really sick, they have boundaries set up to keep people out who have the cold or the flu. Those boundaries protect the sick people from becoming even sicker. That's a smart boundary. Now, about 60 years ago, it became illegal here in America to tell people who weren't white that they weren't allowed to sit in the same places as white people could, on buses and in schools and restaurants and bathrooms. And they were finally even allowed to drink from the same water fountain. Those were evil boundaries, okay? It made sense to them at the time because of segregation laws. They thought that white people were just too good to be with black people. Even in churches. Can you believe it? Seems crazy to us now because we can see that we are all equally created in God's image. And because God is spirit, he doesn't have a skin color. Jesus did. He was brown skinned. Probably like if you took everyone in the world and combined their skin color, it would probably balance out to look something like Jesus's skin. So when those people set up those wicked boundaries, they would probably be making Jesus go to a different church and wouldn't even sit down with him for dinner. They thought Jesus was white, like them. But that just doesn't make any sense when we think about where Jesus lived. Now, even though some people have really messed up boundaries, good boundaries are still important to our lives. They can keep us healthy and safe from danger but they can also be used to hurt others. Boundaries can be helpful, harmless, or harmful. If you have allergies, then you have to create a boundary between yourself and certain things. Some people need peanut or strawberry boundaries. Sometimes they can't even touch those things, like my son with mango skin. But with others, it's enough of a boundary just to keep them away from their mouths. When someone's sick, we try to keep our distance as much as possible so that we won't get sick too. Except for moms, of course, because when someone's sick, we spend a heck of a lot of more time with them. When my twins were really sick when they were kids, I would actually sleep in the same bed just so that I could hear them breathing. Or so if they had to throw up, I would be there to clean it up and change the sheets. But if I wasn't their mom, no way would I be sleeping in their bed with them. That'd be weird. But I imagine with my grandkids, it would be the same. I don't have any grandkids, but it's a good guess. There are things I hate to eat, and so I make a boundary to try and avoid eating those things. That's a harmless boundary. But if I was starving to death, I bet I'd eat them anyway. There are types of music that give me a headache, or I just don't enjoy, and so I program my radio so that those stations don't play. You can learn about what I do and do not like by checking out my music and movie and TV boundaries, you know, what I will and will not watch. There are religious books that I will and will not read, depending on my boundaries, my beliefs. There's only one God that I worship because my boundaries don't allow for me to believe in all the gods of the other religions. And because those boundaries, you know, they're just fine. As long as I don't hate people who do like things that I don't like or can't have or think that I'm somehow better than they are. Most times what we do and do not like depends more on where and when we grew up than our own personal tastes. A lot of times we mistakenly think that we've made our own choices when we really just like what we grew up with and got used to. We like those things that make us feel more comfortable. And when I was in school, 
I was always in one particular grade, not in two or three at the same time. When I was in eighth grade, I learned eighth grade subjects and not kindergarten subjects. When I was in college, my major determined where my boundaries were for the classes I took. Lots of chemistry, physics, and math, and not very much art or music. If I took too many art or music classes, it would have taken me forever to graduate. When my kids were in high school, they went to a technical career school, which meant less math, science, English, and history, and a lot more computer programming and welding. Those were the boundaries that we chose together for what they would focus on. If you take music lessons or play sports, then those things create boundaries in your life. When you spend time on those things, there isn't as much time for other things. If you go into the military, you know, like the Army, Navy, Air Force, or Marines, then they're going to really set some major boundaries on just about everything in your life. In fact, when you're in basic training, they will set boundaries on when and where and how long you sleep and exactly what you will and will not do when you're awake and how you dress and how you eat and probably things that I can't even think of because I never did any of that. Those boundaries will make you a soldier instead of a civilian like me. Are you beginning to see how important boundaries are and how they decide who we're going to be? What if you joined a club that not just anyone can join? Now, that can be a good thing or a bad thing. You know, it's good to have places where men can just be with other men, women can just be with other women. As long as those places aren't there to hurt people or exclude them from opportunities. But what about groups like the Ku Klux Klan or the Nation of Islam? Both groups will say that the skin color of their members is superior. That means better than anyone else's color. And they can even be violent, although it's always been easier for white supremacy groups to get away with killing people. Those groups are always wrong because they insult the image of God in people who look different and have different experiences, often because of how they look, but are otherwise exactly the same. The body of Christ... All the people who love Jesus are every color under the rainbow and speak so many different languages. And because God is spirit, we can't represent him unless we all do that together. We can't love Jesus while rejecting people who are a different color or come from a different country or have different customs. How about the boundaries we have? What or who do we keep in and what do we keep out? Who do we trust and who do we not trust? The worst boundaries are created from things that people have no control over and the best boundaries are created because of the things people do when they have choices. I wouldn't want to only hang around with rich people because some rich people are cruel and untrustworthy, just like some poor people are. Or if I only wanted to be with people I thought were pretty enough or athletic enough or smart enough. Problem with those kind of groups is that they have what are called very shallow standards because none of those things tell us how much like Jesus someone is. The people I love to hang around with and whom I trust are the people who are most like Jesus. And if you read the Gospels, you will see that Jesus was willing to hang around with anyone who was willing to hang around with him. The people who were poor and uneducated, which was most people then, and sick, and all the other people that society thought were just worthless as embarrassed and embarrassing, you know, Jesus sat right down and ate with them, or fed them, or healed them, or told them that the kingdom of heaven belonged to people just like them. They were used to hearing that all those sorts of things were their own fault, and that if they were good and righteous, only good things would happen to them. But does that make any sense to you? Doesn't make any sense to me, and evidently it didn't make any sense to Jesus either. Well, in the book of Acts, Peter learned that God is no respecter of persons, which means that he doesn't have the same standards that we have. Paul said that God doesn't care if a person is born a Jew or a Gentile, if they're rich or poor, if they're enslaved or free. And those were a huge deal. 
when Jesus lived among us. But to people anyway. Now today, if Paul was to rewrite what he wrote about how God looks at us, he might say, in Christ Jesus, there's no high class or low class. There's no black or white or brown or whatever. There's no attractive or unattractive, intelligent or unintelligent, famous or unknown, or whatever else you can think of. It doesn't mean that people aren't all of those things. It just means that God couldn't give a flying fig about them because that isn't how he judges us or our lives. God doesn't care about your fastball but how much you look like him and how you treat others. The famous people to God are those who love others the best. The rich people in God's eyes are those who know him best and teach others about him. The beautiful people in God's eyes are the ones who look the most like Jesus. And the really smart people are the ones who realize that brains aren't enough and ask him for wisdom instead so they'll know how God wants them to behave. All the things that we think are important really don't matter at all in God's kingdom. It's an upside down kingdom. The least here will often be the greatest there and the greatest here will be the lowest there because God has the right standards while we are totally distracted by the wrong ones. What about our bodies? Do we need body boundaries? Oh yeah, you betcha. As much as possible, we need to stay away from people who hurt our bodies. We shouldn't have friends who hurt us or touch us where they shouldn't be touching us. We should always be aware of how precious our own bodies are and the bodies of other people and be very careful about who we let get close to us, who can touch us, and where they can touch us. It isn't for anyone else to decide if they get to touch you. That's your decision because your body belongs to you. Now, sometimes doctors will need to touch you to make sure you're okay. But if something makes you uncomfortable, your boundaries mean that you can say no. You can ask them to explain to you why they think they need to touch you. And if you don't like the answer, it's okay for you to feel that way. Just because I meet you and I would like a hug doesn't mean you have to hug me. Your body belongs to you and only to you. Someday you might get married and then your body will also belong to another person because it will be their job to care for you and your job to care for them. You will still be you and they can't just do whatever they want because your body is still your body and you are the only person who has to live inside it. And same for the person you marry. Their body is for you to love even more than you love your own body. When we can trust one another like that, to always care and never hurt, it's safe to share our bodies with them in ways that we can't trust with anyone else. Now, when Jesus was arrested and beaten and spit on and crucified, his body boundaries were being invaded in the most terrible ways. No one has, was right to do that. When people tried to kill Paul with rocks, they were wrong. When people killed the prophets and when Cain killed Abel, they were not respecting boundaries. Our lives belong to God, and when someone takes our life wrongly, they are stealing from God. And when we steal things, we are always stepping across boundaries and taking something from their side and bringing it over to our side, no matter what it is. Someone steals your bike, they're taking something from inside your boundaries, which include the things that belong to you, and putting it inside their boundaries. Like if you move your fence to make it look like you own more land by taking the land away from your neighbor. There's a verse about that in the Bible. Do not remove a boundary marker, which is a fence, and do not help yourself to the stuff of people who can't defend themselves for their Redeemer, which is God, is strong and he'll take their side against yours. And that's Proverbs 23, 10 through 11, but it's the Miss Tyler version, okay? <laughs> and oh man, you do not want that. You do not want God to take their side against you. Now, boundaries are very important to God. Your boundaries are important to him. He doesn't want anyone to hurt you. He doesn't want anyone stealing from you. 
But everyone else's boundaries are also important to God, and He doesn't want us doing evil things to anyone. No matter what, no matter if they're a different color or come from a different country or are a boy or a girl or anything, not even if they're our enemies. It's like Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard people say, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who hurt you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Because he gives sunlight to the evil and to the good, and he sends rain to the righteous and the unrighteous, you know, so they can both grow things and eat no matter if they're God's friends or his enemies. If you love people who love you, why should you be rewarded for that? Well, even criminals do that much, right? And if you're only kind to your brothers and sisters, what's the big deal? Don't even the people who hate God do the same? God wants you to love people the same way he does. And that's Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 48. And that's the Miss Tyler version again. Which means I took the Christian Standard Bible and I kind of messed with it. So it'd be easier for you to understand. God has the right kind of boundaries and he has a lot of them. But what he doesn't have are boundaries that keep people away from his love. As far as God is concerned, there are only two kinds of people. The people who love him and the people who don't. And he wants the people who love him to always love him, but he also wants the love of the people who don't even know about him yet. God has the kinds of boundaries we all should have, flexible ones. Just like in our lives, sometimes people who are on the inside of our boundaries have to be pushed outside if they're not safe to be around anymore, if we can't trust them. Just because someone is on the inside of our trust and friendship boundaries doesn't mean they can do whatever the heck they want. And we can't just do whatever we want when we love God either. He tells us that we have to grow to love others too. And if we don't behave in a loving way toward others, it's because we don't really love God either. And on the flip side, just because someone starts out on the outside of our boundaries doesn't mean that we can't let them come closer if they prove they're safe to be with. Think of it like a social media account like Facebook. Okay, there are people who are in the friend zone. People who are not friends but can follow you and see what you post. And people who are so dangerous to be around that you block them. Now, based on how people behave, we decide how close they can get, right? And sometimes people who behave for a while suddenly get nasty and after trying to get along with them for a while and trying to be loving, we have to make a decision of how much access we want them to have to us and to what we're thinking. Maybe we just unfriend them and make the posts we don't want them to see only visible to the people who we do trust, who are on our friends list. Maybe we still let them send private messages to us to give them a chance to apologize um, when they're you know, safe to be around again, because people do change sometimes. But what if they send threatening messages or harass us? Then we have to decide if we're going to make it so that they can't send messages at all anymore. Okay. And for the worst cases, sometimes we have to block them so they can't see us or talk to us at all. You know, I had to do that a few weeks ago with some people who were actually lying about me and trying very hard to hurt me. Now, I can't make them stop, okay? There's nothing I can do. Um, but I can decide to keep them out of my life while they're being destructive. Things like that will always happen and only you can decide whether someone will be inside or outside of your trust boundaries. Choose very wisely and be merciful and forgiving when you can, but make sure that you know where your boundaries are so that other people can know when they've gone too far. But you know what? Just because someone is on the outside of your boundaries doesn't mean it's okay to hurt them. If they've committed a crime, then you call the police for sure or get an adult to help you. But when God sends good things, he doesn't just send them to the people who are behaving themselves. He's a loving God, and so he blesses his whole creation. He doesn't starve the people who don't love him or who are mean to you, just like he won't do that to you if you start behaving like a gooberhead. 
Just think what would happen if everyone who believed in him was rich and everyone who didn't was poor. Well, what do you think would happen? Well, everyone would believe and love him, but for entirely the wrong reasons. Now, did you know that Satan said that about Job? Um, that the only reason that God, Job loved God was because God gave Job so much stuff? Satan was telling God that he was having to buy Job's love. But Job loved God no matter what he did or didn't have. And so there are many poor people who love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength and who love their neighbors for all the right reasons and not because they're getting paid to do it. And there are plenty of terrible people out there who have a ton of money, talent, good looks, popularity, smarts, children, houses, or whatever, not because they love God, but just because they were maybe born into the right family or had the right genetics or their bodies work better than others in certain ways, but not because God loves them more. I mean, I'm super smart, okay? Not because God loves me more, but because God gave that to me so that I could teach you. Um, all of our gifts are for others more than for ourselves. If we're trying to be perfect, like God is perfect. So really, maybe God made me smart because he loves you more than me. <laughs> now, when God was talking about being perfect in this way, it was all about how we treat our enemies. God doesn't play favorites by only giving good things to the people who are good. Neither should we. God also doesn't go around smiting everyone who's being bad or calling down brimstone and fire. You know, we shouldn't either. God's boundaries are about justice and mercy, but mercy seems to win more often than not. Justice is very important to God. And justice is a word that means about caring about fairness, peace, and respect. Because God sees everything and knows everything, Justice can look different to him than to us. When we want to get revenge when someone hurts us, sometimes God sees the reason behind what happened and wants to guide that person to better decisions. And if we take revenge, the person who hurts us might never see that they were wrong. If we do something worse than they did, then they'll probably just figure that we deserved whatever they did in the first place. So we have to be really careful. When someone messes, you know, with our boundaries, to be very careful about how we treat their boundaries. Because, you know, sometimes we mess with other people's boundaries and, you know, we would want them to be kind to us so that we can see when we're wrong and not just think they deserve it. Now, sometimes God uses the legal system to give justice. And so when a person commits a crime, we need to leave it to them to deal with it instead of making things worse by getting revenge. When the legal system isn't working, we have to be really careful and band together to change things so that we'll have a more just world that is more fair. If we are truly loving our neighbors, then we will treat their boundaries with the same respect that we treat our own. And so if they're being treated unfairly, we will say something and we will do something. Jesus said something when the powerful people were being cruel to the weak. And so did the prophets. And so did Moses. And so does God all over the Bible from beginning to end. And Jesus was so concerned about justice that he gave his life to give us justice. But without mercy, justice is a scary thing. If a rich man steals a loaf of bread from a poor man, leaving him hungry, it is not at all the same thing as a poor man stealing a loaf of bread from a rich man because he's starving. Even though both are stealing, their reasons are very different. Even though they're both wrong, God looks at the poor man with a lot of mercy, but he will be very furious with the rich man. After all, if God wasn't merciful with us, if he always treated us how we deserve to be treated then we would all be in some super serious trouble and no one would live long enough to even be adults, right? God's mercy boundary is huge. And if we are perfect, ours will be too. Now, I love you and I'm praying for you and I hope you will spend time thinking about your boundaries because you are important and what you think and care about and feel are all important.